Matthews here from the National Weather Service to talk to us about uh, weather models. All right, well, thank you for having me here today. My name is Matthew Belk. I'm a me lead meteorologist with the National Weather Service in uh, Boston, Norton, Massachusetts. I have uh, been working for the federal government now uh, for 30 years. So uh, hopefully we have uh, enough history here to satisfy everybody on uh, weather models and uh, where we're going in the future in this country. Why don't we move past the uh, title slide here? Um, okay. I'm just going to turn off my video just to make sure that I have a uh, good bandwidth, but I will turn it back on uh, when we uh, when we get to the question part, if folks don't mind. So uh, this presentation was actually part of uh, some webinars that we routinely host. Uh, you have to look at the weather.gov slash Boston slash webinars for a list of uh, presentations that we usually give. Uh, they range on a variety of topics from things like weather models. Uh, there's actually a weather models 202 that we did back in March. Uh, so <laughs> if you find that this whets your appetite for more, uh, we may have more advanced material uh, to satisfy your curiosity at a, at a future time. Uh, we certainly take requests as well. Uh, for topics that we could uh, we could discuss. So next slide, please. Well, uh, I'm not Joe and I'm not Bryce. Uh, I've already introduced okay. myself briefly, uh, just for a little bit more context. I've worked in uh, Cincinnati, Erie, Pennsylvania, Blacksburg, Virginia, and I've been here at the uh, NWS Boston <laughs> Uh, Norton office since uh, August 2001. So next slide, please. So uh, there is a, I've just realized this, uh, this is a picture of our supercomputers that we have. Uh, pretty much all weather models are, are just mathematical models that we solve. Uh, we just recently purchased, or I should say leased a new supercomputer. Uh, it's in two parts. One is in uh, Virginia, the other is in Phoenix. Uh, each node or each supercomputer, I should say, is a 10.2 petaflop. So for a total of uh, 20.4 petaflops, which is uh, 213,000 trillion calculations per second. Uh, to put it in perspective, if a human being was to compute a calculation per second uh, between to keep up with the supercomputer, you would need about 650 million years. <laughs> so uh, it's uh, quite a bit of time uh, that these computers save us in the process. So the next slide, please. So just for uh, history, uh, we uh, can trace numerical weather prediction back to the work of uh, Wilhelm Virknes. He's a Norwegian physicist from the uh, early 1900s. He was the first to write a paper suggesting it's possible to forecast the weather by solving systems of linear partial, nonlinear partial differential equations. So as such, he is uh, considered to be the father of modern meteorology. Next slide, please. So there was a, another British mathematician about the same time, a little bit later on in the early 1900s, Lewis Fry Richardson. He spent uh, three years developing Bjorkney's techniques to solve these equations. Uh, he did it with a slide rule, something I've never had to work with and a table of logarithms, which I have had to work with. Uh, and in working amongst the World War I battlefields in France, uh, he computed a single prediction for change in pressure at a single point for a six hour forecast into the future. That calculation took him six weeks of effort and it turned out to be completely wrong. <laughs> so, uh, but it did give us a glimpse into the future of weather forecasting. And if you, if you look off to the right there, there's some of these so-called primitive uh, weather forecast equations. Um, these are probably the smallest equations that we, we would routinely see. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, Richardson saw a forecast factory where he calculated that you would need 64,000 human computers, each responsible for a small part of the globe in order to get through the math at a fast enough pace 
to come up with a, a weather prediction you could actually use. It's, it's great if you can solve the map, but if it takes you six weeks to make a six hour forecast, then it doesn't really do anybody any good. He envisioned that everybody would be in a common room and you just pointed a, well, let's do the math over here. Everybody gets to work and when they move that, then they move on to the next spot. When the Weather Service was originally created as the US Weather Bureau or really the US Signal Corps, this was the model that was followed. Everybody was in Washington DC forecasting for the entire United States. Uh, as computers came onto the scene uh, that disabused the notion that this was even really feasible and uh, the structure of the Weather Service changed as a result. Next slide, please. So uh, John von Neumann, he was really the developer of the, the first computer in the US called the ENIAC. And he recognized that you know, weather forecasting might be a good fit for, for what his machine could do. Uh, so in 1948, he assembled a group of theoretical meteorologists at the Institute of Advanced Study in, in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, this group was headed by Jewel Charney, done extensive work on a simplified filtered system of equations for weather forecasting. Their group was the first to complete a successful model of the atmosphere and really demonstrated the feasibility of numerical weather prediction. Next slide, please. Uh, so the first one day fully numerical weather prediction was made in April of 1950. Uh, in order to get this done, uh, it required around the clock service of the modelers because of various issues with the computer breaking down. And it took more than a day to actually execute the forecast. So you got your forecast, but it was a day late. Uh, so, but it, it really showed that uh, we were getting uh, we were getting closer to having a, a feasible numerical weather prediction. Next slide, please. Uh, so by 1954, we had um, more computer power and uh, mm -hmm. more modeling capability. And that was where we really started to get into some real-time operational numerical weather prediction. So uh, Congress, on July 1st, 1954, formed the Joint Numerical Weather Prediction Unit uh, that was staffed and funded by the US Weather Bureau, the Air Force, and the Navy. And this unit was given pretty much all the resources to construct operational weather forecasts for all three agencies. Next slide, please. So uh, really numerical weather prediction, it's all about how fast is the computer. The faster the computer, the more complex the mathematical models, the more accurate the models become, so on and so on. So it's really all predicated on how fast the computer can you get uh, and can you solve the math correctly. So really through the 1960s and 70s, we just started increasing the amount of data that goes into the models. Uh, especially from weather satellites, which really didn't exist until April 1st, 1960. Uh, so that really allowed the expansion of the model domain and the number of models that we can, we can run. Uh, we've also increased vertical levels and the horizontal resolution of the models over the years. We started with a three-layer hemispheric model in 1962 and a six-layer primitive equation model in 1966. And then that's just continued on from there uh, as we get up to the present day. Uh, next slide, please. So again, just to, you know, folks probably already uh, know that uh, weather models are just a system of the nonlinear differential equations. We solve them and uh, each model does things a little bit differently. This is by design. Uh, we'll get into this a little bit later when we get into ensembles. We typically run global models four times a day, and then we have some other uh, regional models, or what we would consider to be a regional model that we run nearly hourly. Uh, and we'll, we'll get into that uh, a little bit later on. Uh, so the next slide, please. So this is just kind of a crude mock-up of 
what a model might look like. So we have a horizontal grid, which is typically latitude and longitude uh, for the horizontal domain. And then we have a vertical grid of either height or pressure or even something called sigma, which is uh, the pressure at a level divided by the pressure at the surface. So you get a, a vertical coordinate that ranges from one to zero at the top of the atmosphere. Uh, and then on the, the lower left there, we have uh, just kind of a, the sorts of things that we would, we would get into, that we would try to simulate within the, the system of nonlinear differential equations. Uh, there's also some uh, coupled models, especially with the global models, where you're coupling the atmospheric model with an oceanic model, which is going to worry about things like uh, currents, thermohaline, circulations around the globe, uh, etc. So the more things you can account for in your model, the more accurate uh, the forecast becomes down the road. Next slide, please. So here's a, a little bit. Uh, here's a little bit of uh, model domains. So a global model obviously covers uh, the entire globe or hemisphere. For uh, regional models, for like smaller sections, we say the U.S. Uh, we would run that nested within a global model, and then you could even have mesoscale models, which really gets down into the nitty gritty. Uh, but you would run that over a much smaller domain uh, just because of the computing resources required. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so why do we use global models? We want to focus on larger features such as jet streams, uh, tropical cyclones, and other things that impact a, a large portion of the globe. Uh, so this is actually the starting point uh, that also feeds into climate models, which is just basically a global model run over a long period of time to simulate, uh, simulate climate, uh, even just weeks at a time for say an operational forecast for, for an outlook. Next slide, please. Regional models is probably more of what we would use, uh, say forecasting day-to-day -day weather uh, here in New England, where we would we would focus on the details from a regional model that covers North America. Uh, no offense to uh, Andre over in, in Poland, um, I do not spend a lot of my time uh, looking at weather features in Europe or Asia, uh, unless it's something, you know, that's just not my job. We do have uh, people in the weather service, particularly at the Climate Prediction Center, they do. Uh, look at the, the weather all around the world because they're trying to forecast at a, at a much longer time range than I do, where I'm primarily focused on the next seven days. So a regional model is, is where I'm going to spend most of my time before diving into the, the mesoscale models. Uh, next slide, please. And then mesoscale models, this is where we're dealing with things that uh, we typically deal with here in Southern New England, things like sea breezes, uh, forecasting convection explicitly. Uh, we, can, we can get into that uh, during the, the question and answer series. It's just a different type of model. Uh, and these run once per hour, they provide very high resolution, uh, very detailed uh, forecast, but as a result can often be pretty noisy because of the, the fine resolution of the model. Next slide, please. So here's the, uh, what we mean by model resolution. It's an example of a, uh, a 12 kilometer model, which when I first started uh, back in the, the early nineties, our, our best resolution model was about 80 kilometer. So we've come quite a ways in the last uh, 30 years. And then you can see we, we, what a two kilometer model would look like over the same domain. You can just represent features, uh, land or water uh, very differently, the finer resolution that you go. Uh, but with every doubling of resolution, so to go from 12 kilometer to a six kilometer model, you've now made four times the work. So again, this is where the, the computer the computer speed uh, becomes all important. You have to balance, this is the window of time I have to make a forecast 
versus how expensive it is uh, to run a model at, at a particular resolution or with a particular set of equations. Next slide, please. So this is a, one of the breaks um, that we would, we would have here. Um, so I did see some uh, questions here. So let's uh, try to address these. Um, I did not know that about John von Neumann. I will, uh, the question was uh, John von Neumann, was, or statement I should say, John von Neumann was important in the development of a follow-on computer to the ENIAC, but not the ENIAC. Uh, I will research that further and we'll, uh, we'll get that corrected. Um, if computers were infinitely fast uh, and the equation's accurate enough for an accurate solution, um, we still have the problem of getting a, a perfect observed state. It's actually one of the largest sources of error in numerical weather prediction is in order to know where you're going, you have to know where you've been. The other half of that question really was, uh, you know, all the models, for example, said it was supposed to rain last night and today, and it looks absolutely gorgeous. Um, well, it's, uh, I, I guess it depends on, on where you are. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll get into that when we get into ensembles. Um, and this is actually one of the dangers of looking at deterministic uh, models. So what we mean by a deterministic model is a model that you run once and you just get one answer. Uh, ensembles are, you run a model multiple times with different initial conditions uh, and then see if you get the same answer at the end. Uh, you'd also get a more statistically robust solution uh, where you could compute things like 80% confidence intervals and, and get, a, get a broader handle on all the possibilities. Uh, and that will actually, we'll, we'll get into later on if you can just bear with me for another, uh, uh, another few minutes. Uh, so why would we want uh, the tightest grid at the poles? Uh, well, unfortunately, that is the way that a, a latitude longitude grid works. Uh, it's not ideal. I can tell you uh, that the FV3, which is uh, the, the core of the physics system that goes into the global forecast system or the GFS model right now, actually does its computations on something called a cubed sphere. So if you would like more, more details on that, uh, you could go to the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory, FV3. They have a whole page on uh, all the mathematics that go into uh, computing a cube sphere. I'll try to summarize it here uh, and hope I, I have it accurate enough to satisfy. Uh, basically, you, you're not computing it on a uh, sphere, you're computing it on a cube. And then through mathematics, you, you transform the six-sided cube back down onto a sphere by overlapping the edges of the cubes uh, into, uh, into reaching that. So it's kind of like um, kind of like doing a map projection off of a sphere into a Cartesian plane, but you're doing it in reverse uh, is probably the best way that I can describe it. At least that's my uh, my understanding of it. Uh, vertical resolution of the models, again, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment, if you can bear with me. Um, and Ed Lorenz and limits to predictions, yes. Um, deterministic models are, uh, are really tricky. Um, one of my jobs right now is to look at a variety of deterministic models and to try to ensemble them in my head and then figure out, well, which one is correct? And that is where I would like to focus the forecast. So uh, you're, you have multiple sources of error. One is uh, um, having a perfect observed state of the atmosphere to work into the computation, the mathematics itself. And then you have a, a human source of error, i.e. me or my, my colleagues, interpreting the output from these models to come up with what ultimately becomes, what ultimately becomes the forecast. Uh, and then there's other 
errors within the mathematics itself. We may not have represented it correctly. We may not have understood it correctly, how a physical process actually works. Uh, depending on the resolution of the model, you sometimes have to make assumptions. For uh, global forecast models, you tend not to allow convection to be forecast explicitly just because the vertical motion is typically measured in, on the order of meters per second. Uh, in any kind of a fluid, when you introduce that much force, uh, you're gonna cause ripples uh, within the fluid itself. So we, we tend to filter out that smaller scale uh, waves as, as noise, basically. But when you get down to the, the mesoscale models, uh, we have a fine enough resolution to resolve a feature set on the scale of a thunderstorm a little bit more explicitly. So we do allow the convection uh, to be forecast explicitly. And that's just a recent development within the last eight to 10 years to have a, a convection allowing model. Uh, but we can get into that when we get into the, uh, the model section later on. I hope that uh, helps. Uh, where does the input data come from? How often it is, is it entered? Uh, it is entered continuously. We have a continuous data assimilation system. One of the largest sources of input data that we, we get comes from satellites. The main reason is uh, we have an observation at Logan Airport. We have an observation at Norwood. We have an observation at Beverly. We have an observation at Bedford. They're all points, but a satellite sees pretty much everywhere. And you can sample that raster uh, however, you, however you wish. Uh, you can go very fine, you can go very coarse. It depends on the nature of the model that you're trying to initialize. Uh, one of the other processes that we use is instead of taking points and implementing them on a, a gridded field, two-dimensional grid or even a three-dimensional cube, uh, is you take your original forecast that was say one hour forecast from the prior model run and then you use the observations to nudge that forecast closer uh, to the observ closer to the observed state at each point. It's a, a process called Newtonian nudging, and you, you want to you have to do this in a balanced way because you do not want to create such an instability in the model that the model essentially blows up. It can't handle such a drastic change. So you're trying to small tweaks over a longer period of time uh, to, to when you finally get to, we're ready to run the model, hopefully your observed state is in, a, is in a good place and you haven't introduced an artificial instability that the model's then going to try to correct. Uh, an example of that uh, would be uh, convection. It, we would call it convective feedback. Uh, if you initialize a model, a non-convection allowing model with convection, um, bad things happen. <laughs> it, it will take a system and it will, it will literally explode uh, and not uh, provide, provide a, good, uh, a good solution. Uh, so the computer racks within the node you showed are in a straight line. Why are they? I'm not sure I entirely understand that question. Um, and uh, if it's more technical about how the supercomputers put together, that's really beyond my area of expertise. Uh, I presume that the, uh, the people who, who put the racks together um, knew what they were doing uh, and, and set up the communications. All I can tell you is that uh, the models that typically run on those computers have to fit, each model that we run has to fit within a, about a 60 to 90 minute window uh, to not only run the model, but to post-process the model into producing all the output that we see. These would be the weather maps that go online, the model output statistics, any uh, data that gets fed into the next model down the chain, uh, so on and so forth. Um, but that's, uh, all I, I don't really know uh, the intermodule communications time. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, next question. Um, 
Oh, it did rain, just not much, but it did rain. Yeah, it looks like it rained again. Um, so I guess one thing I should mention, uh, since everybody's talking about rain, uh, when we forecast a probability of precipitation, that is for the event of getting 0.01, 0.01 inches of rain. Did it measure or did it not? That is, that is what the probability of precipitation is. So uh, as long as you have 0.01, your probability of precipitation should have been 100%. We make no distinction between uh, 0.01 versus one inch. Uh, we actually compute error using a, a Breyer score for those who are, are familiar with that. If not, we can, uh, we can get into that. Uh, another uh, supercomputers wanted to round and minimize distance of wiring. Don't know if that really made a difference. Um, your Carl, your uh, your guess is as good as mine. That's uh, again beyond my uh, beyond my area of expertise. So, have I answered everybody's question satisfactorily, or is there some other point that we would like to go back over? Yeah, can I ask you a question? A quick one. Do you take sure. into account turbulence in these models? Um, we do. Uh, we we actually. Uh, Typically, uh, it's called turbulent kinetic energy. It's a parameterization scheme. Uh, typically, that's done uh, within the, uh, it's really micro scale, uh, within the boundary layer, which we would define as the from the surface up to the top of the mixed layer. Uh, so uh, for everybody with a physics background, uh, the sunshine doesn't heat the air. The sunshine heats the ground. The ground is what heats the air from the bottom up. Uh, and it, it, air is a poor conductor, uh, so it all has to be done through convection, and that starts from the from the bottom up, and then uh, mixing. So we consider that you know the more heat you have in the ground that's heating the bottom of the air, the more convection you get, the deeper the updrafts go, the deeper the mixed layer that you get, uh, and that the properties of the air at that point. Uh, then become what we would can what we would see uh, a little bit closer to the ground as uh, as it mixes given enough time. I've, I've got a quick question. Um, Matt Noyce and and New England Cable News always talks about their model for precipitable water and and probability of precipitation. Are they buying output from you guys or are they actually running their own? GFS type of models? Um, they are doing both. Uh, so working for the federal government, we are funded by your tax dollars. So my job essentially exists to uh, provide the American public with weather information when they may not have the skill to do it for themselves. So they've, they bought the computer, you know, they're paying for the electricity, the model is run, they pay for the collection of the weather data. My job is to put it into a format that they can use. So really anybody, uh, and we can get into this a little bit later too when we start talking about all the, the different weather models. Uh, we share our weather information through the World Meteorological Organization. That's how we get access to the, the European models uh, because we give them the, the American models. We also have a Canadian model. They get our model. Uh, it's just a free exchange of information, you know, one for one. Um, Canada and Europe operate on a, a slightly different model. They're, they're more like the post office. They're semi-private. So there, there are some paywalls that you have to get through to get access to some of the information, but because it's an agreement between uh, one government to another uh, so the the weather prediction center gets access to the full European. Uh, I do not in the field office, but I get access to some of the output from the European model. Uh, so I, I can't get the full thing directly. That's It's just the agreement that's reached. So uh, as computers have gotten faster, it becomes possible for anybody literally to, to grab a, a computer model and you could run it at home if you're willing to dedicate the time, collect the, 
the input data to get it started and uh, you know, wait to run the output. Uh, one of the models that's uh, really popular is the uh, weather research and forecast model, or we call it the WARF. Uh, that is a model that uh, you could literally run on a home desktop if you wanted to and you had the time. Again, it may take you several hours depending on how far you wanna go out. Uh, most numerical models for our predictive equations, each time step is on the order of a few seconds. So to get from time zero when you start out to forecast hour 384, uh, it's gonna take you a few, a few iterations. Um, and that's generally how it goes. So uh, there are lots of private companies. I know um, uh, Panasonic, um, they've taken a, a basically a, a version of the GFS and they've tweaked a few things and they turn around and sell that model output to whoever is willing to pay. Uh, so it's a, it's a really a mix when you start talking public versus private uh, weather enterprise. Uh, but yes, there are private models that exist uh, as well as uh, public models. Uh, couldn't there be some heating arising from uh, sun hitting dust in the air? Uh, actually, uh, what we've come to found, find out is when you get dust, and I'll give you an example here in a moment, it actually leads to a little bit of cooling. Same thing with volcanic ash, uh, same thing with other aerosols uh, in the air because you're heating the air at a much higher point. So three things can happen uh, with uh, sunlight when, when it hits an object, uh, it, it either gets transmitted through, it gets scattered or it gets absorbed. Uh, so we're not getting the full sunlight when you start putting dust or aerosols or volcanic ash or just something in the way from heating the ground. Really about 50% of the energy that comes from the sun actually makes it all the way down to the ground uh, to, to heat the ground. Uh, let's see, do you run uh, some places in fine grids and more populated places? So we have experimented with the idea of uh, running a uh, variable mesh. Uh, some models do do that, uh, where say over the ocean, where just to save some computing power, not a lot of people out, out on the ocean, uh, you could do a, a say a coarser grid over the ocean and then a finer grid uh, over land. There are some models that do that. Uh, the GFS or the NAM uh, do not happen to be, be one of those models. That is something that we're kind of experimenting with uh, right now. I'm sure in academia, uh, somebody's got one uh, somewhere. Uh, I believe the FE3 does have that capability, but it has not yet been implemented to my knowledge. Uh, that would be something we could uh, we could touch base on at a later point in time. Anything Matt, else? Just, Matt, just to save some time, I'm looking at the clock, it's 1040. I think the questions are interesting and important, but let's uh, let's try to get through the rest of your presentation first before we uh, jump down any rabbit holes, if you don't mind. Fine by me, it's your, uh, it's your party. <laughs> well, if you have all day, we can do this any way you want. <laughs> Well, technically I am working until three, but let's uh, let's try to not go that long. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so uh, here's some of the model output. Um, what we found out is uh, raw models, as I said, make mistakes. Uh, so what we try to do is generate model output statistics where if you can calculate a systemic bias of a raw model, at a fixed point, and you have an observation at that point, you predicted X, but you got Y, uh, you can compute a bias, you can compute a mean absolute error, you can do all sorts of fun things, uh, and, and basically correct for that systemic bias, and that is what these statistics are intended to provide. Uh, I do know that some fields within these model output statistics have as many as uh, 70, 75 predictands 
uh, from the model output that goes into the, the regression equations to, to come up with the values that you would see uh, in the table uh, before you. So we, we have an example of from the global forecast system model uh, for Providence up above. And then we have pretty much the exact same table, but this one came from the uh, North American mesoscale model or the NAM. Uh, and what we found is when we statistically correct for these systemic biases and the raw uh, guidance, uh, we get a much better forecast. As you might imagine, if you're removing systemic bias from the equations, you should, should wind up with something better. Uh, next slide, please. So here's where we, uh, we get into the, uh, the global models here. So uh, the global forecast system is uh, pretty much the, the flagship model uh, for the North, Northern, uh, North American domain. Uh, it actually does run globally, but this is, uh, this is the granddaddy for, for the US Weather Service. We go out to uh, 384 hours, not because a forecast beyond seven days is, is useful, but if you can time lag it out through 16 days, it starts as input going into some of the climate models that will run over uh, further down the road. So we have a uh, vertical resolution of 64 levels uh, versus the three that we were back at in the, uh, the 1960s uh, at a resolution of 13 kilometers on a horizontal grid. So that's about eight miles. And then you've got the, uh, the ECMWF or the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. Uh, one thing you, you get in the government is you get good with acronyms. Uh, so we run for, they run forecasts out to 240 hours at a nine kilometer horizontal resolution with 91 vertical levels. I should mention that the vertical levels are not equidistant. Um, and that, uh, that pretty much is how they're simulating the atmosphere. And again, we, we do these in different ways by design and we'll, we'll get into that when we get to ensembles. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so you have the uh, uh, Environment uh, Canada has their model. Uh, they run it out 10 days at a 15 kilometer resolution, about nine miles with 84 vertical levels. Uh, and then you have the UK United Kingdom Meteorological office, they run theirs out six days at uh, 10 kilometer resolution with 70 vertical levels. Uh, next slide, please. So we have the North American mesoscale model. It runs out about three and a half days. Uh, the purpose of the NAM is to really to be a little bit more of a mesoscale model than the global model. Uh, the domain of the NAM is not global. It's pretty much North America and some of the Pacific and some of the Atlantic. This is so that we can start introducing in some of those features such as convection that we, we tried to account for through parameterizations in the global models, but we're not gonna try to forecast it explicitly. Uh, that's just to keep the math a, a little bit happier. Uh, we do have 60 vertical levels in that. Uh, we also have uh, what we would call the, uh, the NAM nest, which is a three kilometer model. And that is definitely a convection allowing model. It was actually one of the first. We only forecast that out 60 hours. Again, because the resolution is significantly smaller, we had to shorten how far out we could go because again, we have to fit basically any model that we run, you have to fit it within an hour, hour and a half. If you, are, if you only have a 60 minute window and your model takes 62 minutes to run, well, we're not running that model because we can't hold up everything else that the supercomputer is doing uh, just, to, just to squeeze a, a model run in. So you, the windows are really tight uh, and it's up to the, the modelers themselves to make sure that it, it fits within the window that they're, they have. Uh, next slide, please. So now we're really getting down. These are the, uh, the rapid refresh model, which is the RAP or the uh, HER, the high resolution rapid refresh. So if you look at the, uh, the outer uh, square there, that is the domain of the rapid refresh model. And it's a 13 kilometer grid. 
So that provides the boundary conditions. So it gets its boundary conditions from the global forecast system because that covers the globe. So now you've, you've got data at the edges of your grid. And then we do the three kilometer high resolution rapid refresh, but they run over much smaller domains and they get their boundary conditions from the rapid refresh model. Uh, again, because of the uh, time limits that we have amongst everything else, these only go out about 36 hours. Uh, they are convection allowing and uh, they're pretty much, uh, pretty much run hourly. So they, they really, the run from beginning to end is like 25, 30 minutes. And then the other 30 minutes is post-processing the output to be presented to uh, human beings. Next slide, please. And this is where we get into ensembles. I, I kind of touched upon this earlier. We, we already looked at you know, the individual model runs and the way they're being run now, most of the time is you get a single forecast from a single initial time, that's it. Uh, there's no accounting for uncertainty, uh, there's, there's none of that. So we, we really try to use ensemble forecast systems to, to try to get a handle on how uncertain is this forecast. So you've, you've maybe seen this before. If you look at the lower right, we have a, uh, a track for a hurricane uh, from some point in the past. And you can see the, the wide variety of solutions uh, that each of the models that we have access to came up with. So they each provided their answer. It's the job of the meteorologist or the forecaster to sit down, look at all that mass and figuring out which one is right or which one is less wrong. And what am I going to do to convey uh, the expected weather at a, at a particular point? Uh, and as you can see, it's a, it's a bit of a challenge at times. Uh, like I said, each model runs different physics packages, starts with they each compute a an initial condition differently. And we do this by design. Um, if we ran all these models and they did everything all the same way, we would get all the same answer and that's not really useful to anybody. Um, we're trying to get a handle of the uncertainty. So if we were doing it seven different ways and at the end of all seven different ways, we all come up with the same answer, you're gonna have a much higher confidence forecast that that will be the outcome uh, than you would. Uh, I've, seen a, I've seen a forecast uh, for Katrina back in 2005, and it was predicted to make landfall anywhere from, at a five-day forecast, anywhere from Miami, Florida to New Orleans. New Orleans was on the western edge of the outcomes uh, for Katrina, and we all know where Katrina went. It was New Orleans. So even though it was an outlier solution five days in the future, ultimately that is the one that proved to be correct. And this is the danger of just looking at a single deterministic model run and, and just running with it. Um, we try very hard not to do what we call the windshield wiper, where uh, GFS comes in and says rain for Southern New England. And then the next run comes in six hours later and says it's dry. Next run comes in six hours later, says rain for Southern New England. And then next run comes in and says dry. Um, that doesn't lend a lot of confidence to the forecast. So we just try to trend it uh, most of the time. But with the ensembles, you have a broader sample. You can start computing statistics, things like mean, max, min, standard deviation, uh, it just gives us a lot more information on how certain the forecast is, which then impacts how I'm gonna message uh, weather information to decision makers, say a governor of a state, or uh, what's the rainfall chances to a water resources advisory board. Uh, that is part of, another part of my job is providing weather information to other state and federal agency partners. It's not just producing a, a forecast like you might get on TV. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is another way of looking at ensemble solutions. Uh, you could do the tracks or you could do what we call plumes, which is here. So the, uh, all of those lighter gray lines are all of the individual solutions that came from the ensembles. 
and they show you the full range uh, of, of what we have. And this is a, just an example of a quantitative precipitation forecast. In other words, how much rain are we expected to get by which time? Uh, the black line is the mean of the sample and the blue line is what the deterministic or the control uh, for the ensemble, uh, that was its solution. So you, you could see that, uh, you know, in this case, the deterministic run was a little bit lower than the mean and uh, definitely on the lower end of the ensemble spread of solutions, which went anywhere from, you know, call it 0.1 all the way up to, you know, 2.4 inches in this case by uh, uh, 8 p.m. on the uh, 8th of whatever month this was. Uh, next slide, please. So we do have a bunch of global ensembles. Uh, the GFS, we run as an ensemble with 31 members. So we, we tweak the initial conditions 30 times. We have the control. We already have the deterministic run. Uh, we run it we run it uh, about uh, 30 other times by tweaking the initial conditions just a little bit. The ECMWF also has an ensemble. They run a total of 50 members. The Canadian runs a, a 20 member ensemble. Uh, we also take the Canadian with the GFS and produce an ensemble called the NAVE, so the North American Ensemble Forecast System. Uh, so you can, you can really do some interesting stuff uh, with these different ensemble members. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also do high resolution ensembles. Uh, so we take a lot of our convective allowing models. Uh, we have the short range ensemble forecast uh, that has 26 members. And then we have the high resolution ensemble forecast, which has, has 10. Uh, the HREF, uh, is explicitly a convective allowing model. They're all convective allowing models. So uh, where it's forecasting convection, it could be a case of you forecast the mode of the convection. It's isolated thunderstorms versus supercells versus squall lines. Um, but the timing may be off, the location may be off, but it might have the right idea of the, the type of convection that you would you would see, which is, which is why we run those ensembles. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, something that we're experimenting with now uh, in our hazardous weather test bed is using these high resolution ensemble forecasts and you can kind of see a, a paintball example. So each color represents a different member uh, from the model, model members that uh, went into the ensemble and then uh, you can provide guidance to forecasting severe weather in real time. Uh, so you could take the output from these high resolution ensembles uh, and then specifically predict what's the probability of getting severe hail, one inch diameter or greater, or what's the probability of getting uh, 58 mile per hour winds from convection. And then essentially by knowing that information, uh, be able to create a worn on forecast system where the thunderstorm may not have even formed, but based on the numerical weather prediction, it says, well, an hour from now, a severe thunderstorm should be in Walpole. So I'm gonna issue my severe thunderstorm warning for an hour from now, but I'm gonna do it now. And the, the whole goal is to provide as much lead time as we can so people can take protective actions for, for life and property. Uh, it's not ready yet. Again, it's just something that we're kicking the tires on in a uh, test bed to see if we could develop a system that could actually work. Uh, next slide, please. So kind of a, a first step towards that worn on forecast is what, what we call the SCRAM, the St Statistical Severe Convective Risk Assessment Model. This is again, looking at model output like I was saying, uh, and just computing a probability that a, a particular event is going to occur, be it hail or wind, tornadoes, um, whatever event you can think of. And if you can come up with a, a way to assess that probability, uh, it could be put into a, a similar system such as 
as scram. But again, you, you don't want to use a single deterministic run to do this. You need to use an ensemble uh, in order to be able to do uh, stuff like this. And again, that's all predicated on how fast your, your computer is to run all the individual members. Next slide, please. So to that end, um, we are embarking on the national blend of models. Uh, this is kind of the granddaddy ensemble of them all. You can look at the NBM inputs uh, right now. We're, we're taking just about every model uh, known to human existence that we can get our hands on and uh, putting it into an ensemble forecast system. Uh, these are calibrated, so where we would maybe change the weight of influence of each particular model. Uh, they all have differing time ranges. They all do, you know, some models forecast convection better than others. Uh, they would get a weighting system based on uh, expert analysis uh, and go into the blend to come up with a weighted blend to produce an ensemble that we could then use to, to produce a forecast. Uh, because we're looking at uh, Statistics, we can bias correct, just like we did with the model output statistics. Again, the goal is to produce uh, an ensemble weather forecast that decision makers uh, can use to make decisions. Uh, they know what their th threshold is for what level of risk they're willing to assume for the outcome of a particular event. Uh, and that that's just gives us the information that we can can provide to them to uh, better help them uh, make hopefully better decisions. Uh, next slide, please. This is just an example of the output. So once you have an ensemble solution, you could you could provide you could produce a you know 90th percentile max temperature or 10th percentile or whatever percentile suits your fancy uh, sort of thing. And it just gives you a range, you know, if uh, the 80% confidence interval for uh, high temperature today in Lexington was 82 at the 10th percentile to 84 at the 90th percentile, we would have very high confidence that the forecast was probably going to be somewhere in that range. But, you know, if you get a snowfall forecast that says, well, the 10th percentile is zero and the 90th percentile is 24 inches, well, that's a that's a highly uncertain forecast for a particular, for a particular point. <laughs> and it just gives you a, a sense of, well, maybe I don't wanna take that deterministic model as gospel. Uh, there's too many, too many possibilities. Uh, and this is something that, you know, just a month or two from now, we're, we're gonna be dealing with all the time with. You've seen the GFS at 384 hours, there's a big blizzard coming. We will uh, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Uh, next slide, please. Just a, another example of uh, NBM output. Uh, this is a, a wind speed forecast. So you can see that um, we can get some pretty high resolution uh, information, particularly out in the Rockies. You can resolve the terrain uh, pretty well. Um, numerical weather prediction gives us that uh, where all of our all of our observations are point-based. Uh, you can provide a, this is a two and a half kilometer grid uh, for, the, for the continental US that this forecast is on. So it's a, it's a pretty fine resolution grid and, and we can get detail. So in theory, you could just pick an, any arbitrary point in the CONUS and you would be able to get a forecast for that, for that location, very specific forecast for that location. Uh, with the ensemble information attached. Next slide, please. Um, here's another example for uh, a snowfall forecast. Uh, so again, you could see pretty, pretty high resolution. You could see the Appalachians have a little bit higher snow uh, there. You could see a, a little bit higher snow once you get into the, the higher terrain of the Rockies. Uh, so really, really detailed forecast from an ensemble forecast system. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit uh, about the future of where we are and, and where we're going. So when you, when you look at the, the left-hand side of this 
uh, graphic, and and we we're only uh, we only got one more slide after this, so we'll be we'll be good on time. Uh, you look at the the current all the models that are being run, and I haven't counted them up, but it's it's probably in the twenties uh, that we're running right now, and each model serves a specific purpose. Um, sometimes they serve the same purpose, but they're just doing it in a slightly different way. Again, it's to give me and my colleagues a chance to mentally ensemble uh, these deterministic model runs uh, to come up with a better forecast, to come up with the range of possibilities. Uh, we had a moratorium that uh, is going to be ending uh, soon. Uh, and that just basically means there was no model development um, we were just basically putting in the new supercomputer, so nothing was changing. So as you look towards the right, uh, where, we're, where we're headed, where we're headed is we're going to set up more of an ensemble-based approach, but we're going to tailor the ensembles to answer uh, certain questions. So we'll have the, the global forecast system, which will become the global ensemble forecast system. Uh, and that's basically your partly cloudy, 30% chance of showers, northwest wind, five to 10 miles, you know, that stuff. Uh, and that same ensemble forecast system will also take on the role of the subseasonal uh, forecasts. And we'll still have a seasonal forecast or a hurricane forecast that'll be highly specialized. We'll move from the RAP and the HER uh, and the HREF and the air quality model to what will be called the uh, RRFS or the Re Rapid Regional Forecast System. That'll be an ensemble. And that'll be run hourly. So we won't uh, necessarily have um, almost continuous uh, model runs, uh, ensembled information for us to uh, analyze and tweak the forecast as, as new information uh, comes in. One of the other benefits of this approach is um, it's far less computationally expensive. Uh, it's a little bit more efficient in terms of the computer resources that we have. Uh, it also allows us to put more of our human resources into developing better models. Instead of spreading out all the developers to maintain 20 different models, um, we're following a little bit more of the European uh, approach where they take all their modelers and, and just throw them into that one forecast system and try to make that one forecast system as, as best as it can be. Uh, so that is really kind of where we're going. So that would be in the uh, fourth quarter, uh, uh, the rapid refresh forecast system. That's the thing they're working on now. And that's hopefully going to be here uh, by this time next year. Uh, for the global ensemble forecast system, that is the third quarter fiscal year 24. So you're probably looking at, at early, uh, late, late 2023, early uh, 2024 before that comes online, assuming everything stays on schedule. But that's, that's ultimately where we wanna go. The National Blend of Models is here now. It's actually on its fourth iteration. Uh, version 4.1 will be uh, released here uh, here shortly. So the next slide, please. Um, and then this was just an advertisement for the weather models 102. Um, this is just an example of how you could determine a precipitation type where you take a, on the on the left is the uh, probability of rain and the upper left on the left hand side probability of snow. Bottom, bottom left is the probability of freezing rain. And then bottom right on the, the left-hand side is the probability of sleet. And then from all those probabilities, you can generate an output like what is on the right of uh, expected precipitation type at, at that time. So it's just a, a quick example with, a, with an advertisement for the Weather Models 102, which, or 202, I should say, uh, which I'm, I'm not hosting. Uh, that has already happened, uh, but it's just an example of how we can use ensemble systems to, uh, to produce a, a deterministic result. So with that, that is the end of uh, 
what I have. So uh, we'll now uh, go back to answering uh, questions. And we have uh, 24 minutes. So hopefully uh, hopefully that'll be enough time. Well, Ted I had his hand, question. hand up. I, uh, before, before we go there, Ted had his hand up. So let's, uh, let's give Ted a chance to ask his question that we can jump in. Are you there, Ted, or you're frozen? He's frozen, so until, until he thaws out, we'll move on. Uh, do we want to do the chat first, please? And then I, I thought I heard Dave in there with a question. And if you want to raise your hand, Dave, I'll, I'll get back to you. Okay. So uh, Ted actually did ask uh, the question, when you see the spaghetti plots for tropical systems, some of the models solve using the transform versus the let, let long. Is this an issue when you compare the output? Um, map transformations, unfortunately, are, are something that we, we really have to deal with. Um, so yeah, all the, all the outputs from the models are, are put into a same Cartesian plane projection uh, before they're displayed. So everything should be uh, singing from the same sheet of music in terms of, in terms of position. Uh, uh, any special weather uh, requirements? I'm sorry, just to, to cl clarify that one a little bit more. So, if the model's solving on a on a uh, Fourier transform, basically instead of on a Cartesian grid, then um, you end up with differences when you go towards the pole uh, versus the uh, when you're going around. Uh, around the equator because uh, one is parallels and the other are are uh, intersecting the uh, you know circles and so the spacing is going to change with, with the the uh, transform is that an issue at all or do they just blow it off because they don't go far enough north to worry worry about it too much um i think it's more the latter mm. um you know generally if you know if the the whole the whole trick of coming up with these model domains is you want to push the edges because boundary conditions are always a problem. You want to push the edges as far away from the area that you're actually interested in. Uh, so if the edges, the solution is not ideal, um, it has less of an impact on the overall, on the overall forecast. Uh, the global models, um, there's no boundary conditions to deal with. It, it's just really the nested models, the ones that start with the, the boundary conditions from the global model and then feed down. Those are, the, those are the ones that we really have to deal with. And none of those regional models uh, are anywhere really close to the poles where that becomes a, that becomes a problem. To follow up, Matthew, is, is that gonna become an issue? Um, you know, looking at, you know, being a pragmatic pragmatist with global warming where, where where the poles become more important in terms of navigation, in terms of, of, of other things where we really wanna know what's going on at the poles? Um, well, this gets into having a, a perfect observed state and obviously the atmosphere is coupled with the ocean in real life. Um, have we truly represented how the, the physics of that interaction works no. uh, cor correctly? Um, I'm going to guess not, just because we haven't really observed it uh, to the point where we, we really can figure it out. Uh, you know, this is, again, one of the uncertainties of, of numerical weather prediction. And, you know, we have a, a bunch of bright people working on these very problems day in, day out. Uh, it's just not something where we're, where we're there yet. Uh, Fair enough. You know, maybe, maybe another 20, 30 years from now. You know, like I said, when I first started in the early 90s, uh, the best model that we had was uh, the nested grid model, and that was an 80 kilometer grid. And then the, we had the, the limited fine mesh, which was its precursor. And that one, I think, was, I want to say 90 to 100 kilometers. It was just, it was a mess. Uh, so See, really, it's, it's just we've made leaps and bounds in the last couple of decades. And I, I expect uh, that we'll, we'll make similar leaps and bounds in the next couple of decades to come. 
That's better than what I thought. I thought the first invention was putting a window in the weather office. <laughs> you know, we, we did finally, when we moved from Taunton to Norton, we've, we've, one of the things we asked for was bigger windows and they, they gave them to us. There we go, see? Technology <laughs> works again. Uh, I had a question. Dave, please. Yes. Yeah, I was just wondering, because I wrote it in the chat, is there any uh, special techniques for, for weather forecasting around the equator area? Because uh, years ago when I was in South Africa, or an engineer, me, and I met a weatherman down in South Africa and we got talking. And lo and behold, he had to go back to his office to check to see the differences between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere relative you know, to the highs and low pressures. I, th I mean, I got a big charge out of that one. <laughs> but oh, it's yeah. vector analysis, you know? So, um, so really, when you're forecasting around the equator, and I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you a, a brief uh, interlude here. Uh, it didn't impact me, but it impacted my wife. Uh, yeah. back, back when we were in school together, uh, she had the uh, good fortune or misfortune, as the case may be, of uh, being taught uh, atmospheric dynamics by a visiting professor from Australia. <laughs> so uh, she got taught all the physics and all the mathematics. Exam came along and everybody bombed. Everybody. And then they finally figured out why. Uh, really, the difference between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere is the signs of the terms change. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she was she was taught the southern hemispheric version of atmospheric dynamics, but the quiz was in northern hemisphere. Hence, everybody got got the wrong answers because all the signs and the equations that they were using were were different. Uh, so <laughs> for myself, when we were doing a, uh, I took a class, um, it was just kind of a weird class. It maybe sounds weird, but it was a, it was a forecasting practicum class. And they were, they would have us forecast for places all around the globe. It's okay. We're forecasting the high temperature in Sapporo, Japan today. Um, we would do Rome, we would do all sorts of places, and your grade was based on, well, how good a forecast did you make for all the forecasts that we made over the course of the semester? <laughs> that, was your, that was your grade. Uh, one day, uh, we were given the challenge of forecasting for Melbourne, Australia. Uh, and the, the entire purpose was to see who was thinking, oh, this is in the Southern Hemisphere. Everything moves in a different direction. Right. Opposite. Uh, so we, we actually got around that by taking the maps that the professors had put up and we flipped them upside down so everything would move from left to right the way we were. The way we were. <laughs> clever, clever. So we did, we did figure it out, but that's really the only major consideration. Um, you know, one other problem that we run into with the equator. Again, uh, for numerical weather prediction, you have to have a really good observation. So two thirds of the globe is covered by ocean. Well, we don't have a tremendous amount of observations for all the things that we would like observations for uh, over the ocean. The, at the equator in particular, there's very little land mass uh, around, that, around that latitude. So. <laughs> There, there are a lot of assumptions that go into making a, a forecast when you're starting uh, in that area. You know, I'll tell you, that does make sense because, you know, I'm, I remember Don Kent when he used to, you know, the old weatherman here from greater Boston. And for years, because New England jets out about 100 miles into the Atlantic, you know, there was a, an area between us and the middle of the coast, the East Coast, that there was no data coming in, or not enough data coming in. Mm -hmm. And I yeah, remember we, those days. Well, I'm we, an engineer, uh, you can tell we're all engineers here. So. <laughs> yeah, we, we have um, very few buoys, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll take anything we can get. So we, um, we take uh, aircraft, aircraft observations. They have instrumentation that they can report things like temperature at which pressure, at which time, you know where they are. 
at the time they took the observation, we'll ingest all that. We do the same thing with ships. Mm -hmm. uh, if shipping is available to provide an hourly or at least in every six hour, you know, give us a pressure, give us a temperature, give us a wind, you know, something, anything, you know, we'll take it. You know, <laughs> it, it, it'll be quality controlled before it gets put into the initial state of the model. But again, um, over the ocean, we, we really have to make do uh, with what we have. Right. Uh, yeah. The next question was, does the US Weather Service do long-term climate modeling? And the answer is yes. Uh, we actually have the Climate Prediction Center, which is one of the national centers within the National Weather Service. And that is all they do, which is why I do not. My, my job is to, fo I'm hired to focus on the next seven days. I don't do anything else. Uh, there are other people who are more importantly trained uh, in doing long range climate prediction modeling uh, and prediction. Uh, and those are the folks at the Climate Prediction Center and, and that's what they do. And they don't worry about the, the next seven days uh, quite, quite as much. So we're all part of the whole. Uh, just trying to accommodate as many needs and uses uh, as we can. Again, the part of the reason the, the agency exists is to supply weather information in a form that people can use to make decisions uh, when they may not have the skill to go to the, the raw information and come up with that for them for themselves. Uh, if you're curious about the cost, uh, the budget for the U.S. National Weather Service is about a billion dollars. And that's to pay the people to run the models, to operate the satellites, uh, and that's per year. Uh, so given 330 million people roughly in the country, it's a little bit more than three bucks per person per year. Um, so I would say if I can plug our own agency, you know, we're, we're pretty good value for $3 and change. So I... Ted, just a heads up for you. I'm going to let some people who haven't spoken first to uh, ask their question. I'll get back to you if you don't mind, please. Uh, Tony. Uh, thank you. Uh, most of us are within I-95 or 495 around Boston. And every time we have a very hot day, I keep thinking that that day would have been much cooler if everybody had their air conditioner off. <laughs> I noticed in one of your slides, you had uh, as one of the inputs, man-made sources like power plants and other things, cars maybe, was up around mm -hmm. slide. Uh, do you have the capability of running this model by disabling some of those sources and kind of look at what the temperature distribution would have been, let's say within 128 around Boston with the air conditioners on and the air conditioners off? Or would that be in the noise and you wouldn't notice any kind of delta? Um, I would say, uh, yes, we have the capability. Um, the models right now are frozen uh, because we're moving to the ensemble forecast systems. We're not changing the deterministic models in any way just because we don't have the, the people resources uh, to do that sort of thing. Um, we would certainly have the capability to alter the parameterizations that would account for things like air conditioners or cars or buildings, uh, stuff like that. But as I said, the schedule is really tight right now. It's not feasible in an operational environment to do that sort of thing. Uh, you would need to be in more of a research environment. That would be more something that we would leave to academia uh, to research. So one of the aspects that we're, we're really working with right now is something we call research to operations and operations to research. Yeah. So the operations to research bit is, here's a problem that we have that we need to solve. We don't have time to do this, but you do. Please solve it for us, come up with the system, and then we take that research and put it back into, into operations. So really the weather enterprise in the United States is, is really a partnership between the public, the private sector, which is dealing with things that by law I cannot do. Yeah. Uh, and then the academia providing the, uh, some, of, some 
um, probably the vast majority of the, of the research capability that we have to improve the, the operational systems that we have. So for example, um, I, have to pub I have to forecast for public safety, uh, protection of life and property and the nation's economy. If you are a private company and you want a very specific forecast for your plant to run an experiment that is weather sensitive, I cannot help you. Because if I help you, then I have to help every private company out there with the exact same problem. That is where the private enterprise comes in. They will help you uh, for a fee. Um, so it's, it's really, you know, being in the public sector, what you do for one, you must do for all. You can't show, you can't show favorites. And that's kind of how the system is set up uh, here in the US. A brief follow-up comment. The reason I ask for this is that I feel that sometime in the future, as the computers get faster and there's, we have more and more sensors so that the model can be more accurate um, and the differential equations hopefully get better. Uh, you may have the opportunity to say, here is the temperature we forecast today and here is what it will be if you all turn off your air conditioners tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yep. <laughs> Don't forget to conclude how many people will die because they didn't have their air conditioning. <laughs> uh, let's see. So uh, Ted had asked a question, how far up into the atmosphere do the models go? Um, depends on the model. Um, obviously, uh, most models, particularly the ones with you know 70 to 90 levels, uh, the levels down close to the ground where the people are, you might have one that's uh, the, the surface of the ground. Then you might have the next level up might be a couple of centimeters. Next level above that might be at four meters. Next level above that might be at 10 meters. And then as you get up towards the top of the atmosphere, the spacing between the vertical layers, depending on what you're trying to represent, um, will vary. Uh, so, uh, it, it really depends on the model and, and what, you're, what you're trying to represent. In general, I would say we most weather models go from the ground up to about the, at least the stratosphere. Some models go up to the thermosphere. It depends on, uh, depends on what, you're, what you're trying to represent. So that volcano that blew up that island uh, near Tonga, Mm -hmm. uh, that in injected perhaps as much as 10% of the of the water vapor that's in the stratosphere was injected in that one instant where that uh, eruption occurred. So do your models play with that kind of a change in the, in the upper parts of the troposphere or the lower parts of the stratosphere? Because I think it went up to 57 kilometers altitude. Uh, um well, I know that uh, model output that I routinely see goes up to about 100 millibars. Mm -hmm. um, so, or, or hectopascals, mm -hmm. uh, if you're more familiar with those. Yeah. So if this you're more this familiar was, with those units. So this was um, it's, it's it's this was higher than that. Yeah, it's it's pretty high up. Yeah. Um, you know, again, I I don't know uh, off the top of my head all the vertical levels of the the models, but I could I could certainly find it. Yeah, because that's kind of a fascinating experiment that, you know, the nature has performed for us, uh, mm -hmm. getting that much water vapor. All the other volcanoes that erupted in the satellite era mm -hmm. apparently did not deliver water vapor to the stratosphere significantly. This one did because it you know, erupted right under the surface of the water. Well, we do, uh, we do try to observe uh, as much as we can. Um, so just as a, a follow-up question from Steve, how do, how do we get data at that altitude? Um, we uh, do it a couple of ways. We still launch weather balloons twice a day. Um, at least we used to in Chatham uh, before the uh, upper air site fell into the, well, we, we took it down before it fell into the sea, but uh, the site where we were was on a bluff and the bluff collapsed into the ocean. So we had to move it. We're looking for a new location now. 
But weather balloons are still launched twice a day at 12 Zulu and, and zero Zulu, which uh, for here in the Eastern daylight time, zero Zulu, zero Zulu is 8 p.m. and uh, 12 Zulu is uh, 8 a.m. We still launch those uh, around the world. So the weather balloons, they can get up to, you know, up around 200, 100 millibars on occasion, depends on when the balloon pops. Uh, but the other, re the other way we get it is we do it through satellite. Um, we have 16 bands or 16 frequencies on the, the latest goes. Uh, each, each frequency has a different absorption property uh, traveling through the atmosphere. So we would get to sample at 16 different levels, mm. uh, 16 different things through, through the atmosphere. So is it perfect? No, but it's, it's what we got uh, right now. Dick, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I have a real open-ended question for you. Why is it that some days the models seem to be pretty much the variation is very, very close, so you they're, they're pretty much on uh, the same, whereas other days you can mm -hmm. have wide variation. Uh, can you give us any kind of sense of why that occurs and what's what's happening with the models? Yep. So since the uh, since the equations for the model aren't changing on a daily basis. The one thing that is, is the initial condition. So just with any computer program, garbage in, garbage out, um, it all comes down to that observational error. And how does that observational error grow uh, as you forecast out in time? As I, as I mentioned earlier, our predictive equations are pretty much you're only forecasting a few seconds out at a time. If you ask me to make a forecast, well, uh, the temperature outside right now, and whatever, let's see, what is my uh, temperature outside right now? Uh, well, probably not 61, I'll have to look, but we'll just take 61 as an example. 25C in Lexington. Yeah, uh, okay, so let's see. Uh, so it'll be uh, 70, 77. Close enough. So 77, that's our initial condition. If you're asking me what the temperature is 24 hours from now, just in one leap, um, your guess is as good as mine, uh, where we, we just basically try to take advantage of the calculus where we iterate a predictive equation just a few seconds at a time. And then that becomes our, our initial condition for the next phase. Uh, it keeps the model a little bit stable. It keeps us from introducing instabilities where the model has to correct. But that is where you, you get an observational error that the model takes with, you know, takes its initial condition and just runs with it. Uh, and that is why we're trying to get away from deterministic models per se, mm -hmm. not because they don't have value, but because they can lead you into making really bad decisions just because it's just the one answer or you're not you're not getting a grasp of the full range of possibilities outside of an ensemble system so you're trying to take into account as you go on here how the changes are occurring you're you're trying to uh, to use changes more than just the initial conditions is that correct exactly so you're you're just forecasting a well it's a differential equation so it's a rate yeah. of change yeah um, and it's only a partial <laughs> right. Partial nonlinear differential equation. Right. Uh, so there's all sorts of sources of error that you could introduce into the system. So if you make a really big jump in time, um, you're probably not going to be very happy, happy with the result. So we'd rather just do it incrementally through small changes uh, to get out to the point in time that you want to be, which is why we need a really fast computer. I mean, if we could, we're just going to do it in one shot. Give me a calculator, and you know, let's let's have that. Uh, but try try to do it at the scale that we're doing globally for the resolution that we're doing, at the time steps that we're we're typically iterating over. So what you see as a model output, you know, zero six, you know, or even hourly, that's just a snapshot of what the state of the model was at that point in time as it was running out a few seconds a few seconds out at a time as a delta t. Mm -hmm. Matt, to, to, just to be respectful of your time, it's 1130 uh, and uh, it's up to you where we want to go. There's a couple of questions in the chat. 
Yep. And I uh, have uh, I have a little more time if if folks need it. The, uh, Jerry Jerry Slate asked an interesting question. I think is 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 sort of you know maybe they could talk about different things. Why was the storm of seventy eight severely under forecasted? Um, well, since I was seven, well, it's probably, so what's your fault? I was probably six at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we can we can blame you. <laughs> yeah, um, a lot of it was uh, the types of models that we had at the time. Um, they just weren't that good. Um, the observation systems that we have had back then are nowhere near where they are now. Uh, so again, you really need to you really need to have a good initial condition. What's the observed state of the atmosphere? Uh, you have to know where you are before you know where you're going. Um, you know, we just didn't have a good grasp of of what how the physics worked or or had good observations. You know, we had some, uh, but it, it just it's vastly different now how we're how we're at and then there's also again also the human the human element you know one thing humans are great at that computers are still not quite as good at is pattern recognition you know we all look at look at some data and then you recognize a pattern you know you don't have to think about it too much your brain just clicks and so i've seen this before it's the analog forecast system uh you know dig down deep into the recesses of the brain and what happened the last time I saw this uh, sort of thing. That's something that people are still involved. And this is why I think eventually, even as we go to ensemble forecast systems, uh, the computers aren't going to fully uh, take it over. It's gonna be more uh, the human being over the loop as opposed to being in the loop where you're just kind of overseeing and making corrections. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, um, back when I started, even back in school, late 80s, early 90s, you know, I had a, a better than a coin flips chance of beating the model. You know, the model could be forecasting 77 and, uh, you know, I could, I could go 80 and I could beat it. Uh, nowadays, with the MOS having, you know, regression equations with, you know, 70 plus terms, um, the computer is getting progressively harder to beat. Uh, where you beat it is recognizing that this is a pattern that this particular model does not handle well. I'll give you an example. Uh, the global forecast system with Arctic air mass outbreaks over the Northeast uh, forces the cold air out too quick. That is just a systemic bias, something I've noticed over the last 30 years. So when I see the GFS model doing that, say, well, that is probably not gonna happen. I'm gonna hedge my bets that this cold air is gonna stick around longer. And that's where the human being improves on the model. Now, here's the fun part. As the physics packages of each of the models changes over the years, all of the previous biases that I have stored away in my brain no longer apply and I get to learn a whole new set. <laughs> so, that is uh, that's why it's a continuous learning learning process to work with the models as opposed to working to to beat the models, uh, so to speak. And again, that's where the ensemble forecast systems will come into play. We'll have a little bit more information. We'll be able to gauge the uncertainty in a more quantitative way. Um, you'll still have a human intuition to provide input as to, well, I really think you should be trending towards the lower end or the higher end of these solutions just based on you know my experience uh, that is that is ultimately the forecast system that will be uh, that will be moving to great before before we go Joel has his hand up then we'll get to Ted uh, let me just do a PSA here quickly uh, next week we have a, a, a potpourri and currently we don't have anybody uh, asking any questions for discussion or want to present anything. So if you do, just send uh, an email to the group, and uh, we'll get you scheduled, and we can we can uh, we can get that in and and take away a, a video for sure. Secondly, uh, in the beginning of September, we have uh, a professional day, if you will, where people talk about uh, their life and how they how they came to technology. We have some new folks on the on the call today, and thank you for for joining us. I hope you're still here. Um, 
please feel free to uh, contact us and uh, let us know. We'd like to hear your story and, and your background. Always interesting. We all got here somewhere and, and somehow by hook and by crook. So it's, it's always fun to find out how other people have done it and their journeys. Uh, so back, back to the, uh, the program, back to the normally running program. Joel first, then Ted, please. Uh, you've talked a lot about ensemble models. And the question I have is, how are the various individual modules being combined into the ensemble? Uh, so you could do a poor man's ensemble where you take uh, differing forecast systems. I'll give you an example. The NAFES would be a would be one of those systems uh, where you're you're mixing Canadian ensemble members with GFS ensemble members. Most of the time, when we're talking about ensembles, um, in the case of the the GFS, the GEFS, it's the GFS model being run as the control, the deterministic run that we see. And then it's being run 30 more times with a slightly different initial condition. Then you, you can compare that with another uh, uh, heterogeneous model, which is the uh, HREF, where that is the, uh, the NAM uh, WARF model with the uh, ARW core, there's the FE3 core, there's the uh, three kilometer NAM nest. So they're all different models. And then you take the prior run from each of those models and that's how you get up to the, there's five of them. And then you, you take the prior run and get up to the 10. So 10 members is not nearly as robust as 31. The, G, the uh, EC ensemble system has 52 members. The national blend, when you, when you take all of the individual members that go into the blend, you're well over 150 individual members that go well, into the ensemble system. So the statistics are, are a, a bit more robust. My question really is now that we have 30 or 50 or 100 results, you got to come up with one answer, which yep. is the ensemble. Yep. Do you average them? Do you take the mean, median? Uh, do you? Uh, look for clusters? Do you do a yep. regression? Uh, All of the above. Okay. The, most common, the most common output that's publicly provided is the mean. Um, Not the but, median. Yeah, but we also get, um, at least uh, on a daily basis, we get the, the 10th percentile and the 90th percentile Good. from the sample. Um, we also can, for some fields, get the 25th, the 75th, and the 50th percentile. So it, you know, from that, you can compute a distribution and you can, you could compute a value for anything you want at any okay. level of Thank confidence you. that you want. Does that answer Thank your you. question? Yes. Thank you. That was a good question. Ted, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, I'm always intrigued by um, what the, I think they, 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 it's a brand name or something like that that's run by the, the, the various TV weather forecasters that's called Futurecast. Mm -hmm. And it attempts to recreate into the future what the uh, satellite and uh, even uh, some of the fairly sophisticated uh, Doppler weather radar and stuff like that uh, outputs look like. And the kind of naive TV weathercasters uh, who uh, just kind of point at things and stuff, uh, believe it. Whereas uh, the more seasoned people who've been at it for a number of years, like uh, uh, Kevin Lomanovich uh, for uh, uh, Channel 25 and uh, uh, the people like Bruce Schweigler, who used to be there at you know, Channel 4 and, and uh, the Harvey and all these other people, those guys would always be skeptical about it. They would say, well, it looks like there's blobs all over the place and you probably might get a blob here or there, but I don't think there's nearly as many blobs. At what level are they interpreting things? Uh, is that future cast basically taking your output and then kind of running a simulation on the, on the uh, what the weather radar and, and what the, the uh, satellite image would look like if that set of conditions were there. Is that how they do that? Yeah. 
So um, they get those from private vendors. So that's oh. the private weather enterprise. Oh, okay. I honestly don't know if they're grabbing a model like the, the high res mm -hmm. rapid refresh or if they've cooked up their own model in-house to produce that output. Uh, we do have numerical models that can you know, produce, provide a prediction of simulated satellite or simulated radar. Now, uh, IBM really, bought the Weather Channel at, at one point or other. I don't know if they still own them or not, but uh, uh, yeah, that's, they... yeah, that's all um, really private enterprise. And I mm -hmm. have very little, very little knowledge of, of the behind the scenes of what they're doing or what they're providing it, regardless of of what it's called. They could be taking the HERV and calling it Futurecast. They could do something in-house. Mm -hmm. um, like, like I know NECN, they have a model that they run. They set up their own forecast system. So it it really varies depending on the vendor and who they're, who they're paying to get access to that information. But you're right, uh, it does take some experience. And this is, what, again, why we're trying to get away from deterministic single model runs because even though the model explicitly allows convection and it may very well show a pulse thunderstorm versus a supercell, it may have that right, but it, it may be two hours too fast and 50 miles west of where it actually, where it actually happens. You know, you know, it's just a simula it's a mathematical uh, fantasy, if you will. Uh, so, so are they basically the weather just, forecast just making up science fiction for the public? Is that essentially what you're saying? I mean, without saying it so many words. Um, if you take it literally, it is based in science, but it, it may not be correct. You're not accounting for the uncertainty that's inherent in the in the system when you do that. Uh, so it's it's not necessarily science fiction it's just one possible outcome out of however many possible outcomes there are and like i mentioned earlier if you have an ensemble system and you're calculating it 50 different ways and you all come up with the same answer at the end of all 50 different ways that is a high confidence forecast and that's where you want to be uh, but if you get a snowfall forecast from all 50 members that says well the 10th 10th percentile is zero and the 90th percentile is 24 inches. Um, not gonna hang my hat on any particular solution just, just yet. I mean, if it, com if it comes down to it and I have to provide a answer, I'm probably gonna trend towards the mean or pick some other percentile uh, that I think might be more appropriate, but that's where the human element uh, comes in and the, which is yet another, another source of error. Uh, Matt, uh, Larry Wittig asked the question, and maybe I can paraphrase it a little bit. Uh, I'll just, I'll, maybe I'll read it. That's probably the best thing to do. Do you keep track of which models work best and weigh them higher in the ensemble? And more generally, uh, what you know, what goes into the weighting that you do use? Um, yes. The latter part I, is, is my addendum. Okay. Um, I do not do this personally. Um, the people who work on the models, we have a model evaluation group at the Environmental Modeling Center. The Environmental Modeling Center is the national center responsible for operating all of our supercomputers and running all of our weather models and developing our weather models. So those are the folks who verify uh, the model forecasts that go into the, that, that go into the ensembles um, and they provide their expert opinion on which model did best. Uh, and then the people who are working on the national blend of models those are the folks who will calibrate the weight, uh, the relative weight of each individual model into the, uh, into the input. Um, it's relatively static between releases just because you don't want it necessarily changing on a daily basis. As I said, as, as model forecast systems change, you then have to relearn all the systemic biases of that system. And if it changes on a daily basis, you have no hope of computing a, a systemic bias that you could then try to remove from the system. Do, do these do these models uh, change seasonally to adjust for differences in, in say the winter patterns versus the summer patterns in the northern uh, hemisphere, if you will? Uh, the models don't change seasonally. Um, the models do change when the entity responsible for running that model decides 
hey, we have a good enough physics package that we've developed, the resolution's better, we've added more vertical levels, we've fixed this wet bias in the, in the model, we would like to implement it operationally. Um, so they do change, um, but I wouldn't say it's on a seasonal basis. It's maybe you know once every year or two. Because yeah, before, you, before you do make a change, you wanna make sure you've actually improved improve things before you before you do that and i just want one last thing from me and i don't mean to to take a lot of time you talked about pattern recognition as soon as someone says pattern recognition i think of artificial intelligence and it, do you have any insight into where that's being used in, in weather forecasting um we're probably just at the initial stages of machine learning in terms of taking on some of the some of the pattern recognition from the from the forecaster, so to speak. Um, as far as I know, there's nothing available publicly of, of machine learning. Uh, the SCRAM is kind of one of those machine learning things where you're assessing model output to put a probability on severe weather, but that's, a, that's an initial attempt at uh, coming up with something like that. I would expect that as computers get faster and we can develop more complex models have a big enough sample to train the machine learning on that that would become more of a thing uh, more of a thing down the road um, but it's not something that i see happening tomorrow that's maybe you know five ten years out before that becomes a significant player in my unexpert opinion of uh, somebody somebody could watch somebody will come up with a system tomorrow and hey we of figured course. it out guaranteed <laughs> <laughs> Guaranteed, or or later this afternoon. There we go. Uh, Matt, thank you, thank you so much. I don't see any hands up here, and, and uh, we've taken a lot of time. It's been uh, very informative, and uh, we're every time we see a weather forecast, we're going to privately thank you. Thank you. <laughs>